it's going to be like drinking out of a fire hydrant. I'm going to be coming at you fast and hard today. All right. Uh, but we got a lot to cover in this series and, and kind of a short amount of time to get it done in. Um, back when I was in junior high, and whew, that's a long time ago now. We had several weeks of severe rain. Some of you who went to junior high in the late 60s might remember that. Uh, it was a record year that year. Uh, that's when we had a miracle march, I believe it was. And uh, actually, Tioga Junior High had a moat around it. You, you, you couldn't get to the junior high without walking through mid-knee-high water. It was unbelievable. Uh, the entire Fresno, Central Valley area was, was a flood zone. Um, if you lived out at, um, the, down by the river, um, what's, uh, what's the name of that mobile home park? Uh, Wood? Wild Water. Well, uh, that, down there. All, all those mobile homes were halfway up with water. There's a, an old story I've told for years. I, I think it's folklore. I really don't believe it to be true, but there's a story passed around during that period of time that uh, the Fresno Bee sent a reporter out to investigate and write a story about the mobile home park. And the reporter was up on the bridge there at 99 looking down and water halfway up. And he was looking for activity, anything going on, stuff to write about. And he noticed some movement on top of one of the mobile homes. And there was a woman sitting up there. And he thought, oh my goodness, when they evacuated, she didn't get out and she stuck, trapped up there. And he, he kept looking around and he noticed there was a small rowboat that had washed up on the side of the hill. And he worked his way around there and found a piece of wood that he could use as a paddle. And he paddled his way out to that little mobile home and he tried not to scare her. So he got up kind of quietly and he got up to the top. He noticed the woman just sitting there looking off the front edge and her head was just going back and forth back and forth and he assumed she was looking at all the stuff taking down being taken down river in this flood and he sneaks up and he looks down over the edge without disturbing her and he notices that what she's watching is a baseball cap goes down and gets to the end of the mobile home and it turns around and it goes back the other and it floats upstream and, and and he watches three or four times and he's absolutely mystified and now he reaches over and he says ma'am do, do you know the deal behind that baseball cap she said, yep, that'd be my husband. Your husband? Yep. He said he was going to mow the lawn today come hell or high water. <laughs> <laughs> now, as, uh, as I told you, I'm not really sure that's a true story, all right? But it, it, it is a good story. And I hope it helps us understand at the outset of this message, which is sermon number two on the road to recovery. I hope to understand where sometimes you and I can end up in the problem process. And that is, we often focus on the lawn while everything else is floating away. We get so focused on one thing that we think is most important when everything else which is most important is leaving us. Last week we discovered that all of us need recovery because none of us are perfect. There is imperfection in this world. You're imperfect, I'm imperfect. And we've all been hurt and we have all hurt others. We, we all have our own sets, unique though they may be, of certain hang-ups and some peculiar habits that we'd like to change. Who needs recovery? Everybody. Every one of us. We also learned last week that the steps are the same regardless of what your problem is. Whether it's a hurt or a hang up or a habit. And we talked about this last week that the root cause of all of this comes from our desire to want to control our stuff and everybody else's stuff around us. And it seems like the more insecure we are, the more we want to control stuff. We want to control our life. We want to control other people's lives. We want to control our environment. In other words, we want to be God. Uh, speaking of control, how many of you think we need to change the controls of the temperature in here? Cold? All right, let's turn the coolers off because it got hot. Let's turn them off and let's just see how we do with uh, 98.6 furnaces blowing. About 200 of you all at one time. We'll see where we go. But we like to control things. And when we try to control things ourselves, what do we end up with? We end up with fatigue 
and frustration and failure. And so how do we break out of this cycle? How do we break out of fatigue, frustration, and failure and trying to play God? Uh, the key is we have to get past denial. Denial is what keeps us from moving into recovery. You see, we excuse ourselves with things like, oh, r really? It's no problem. No, I'm, I'm, I'm fine. I've, I've got everything under control. I, I can handle it. You see, what we do is we excuse ourselves and then we accuse other people. I got it under control. If they would just get it under control, I would be much better off. If my wife would just get her act together, our marriage would be better. Th that's not my quote. <laughs> we play the blame game. We accuse and excuse and we're very short-sighted. We say, how you doing? Well, well, well I'm good so far un un under the circumstances. So far, so good. And we don't realize that we've just jumped off a 10-story building. We're halfway down. We haven't hit bottom yet. But so far, so good. We've learned the art of denial. There was an ad in the lost and found section of a paper several years ago, and it illustrated denial to its core. The ad read like this, lost, three-legged dog, blind in the right eye, missing left ear, broken tail, recently castrated, answers to the name, lucky. <laughs> That's what I call denial, man. <laughs> so many people in church are like lucky. There's a barb in church, not, not our church. So don't think about the barbs in our church and say, ooh, that's who Tim's talking about? No. Barb's life is a mess. Her drinking problem's out of control. And her husband, Ken, it really is a real couple, Barb and Ken. Ken refuses to cover for her anymore. Everyone around her sees Barb's problems, but they all pretend like everything is just fine. It's a classic case of denial. Every Sunday, Barb and her family dress in their Sunday best. They go to church as the perfect little family. Everyone at church looks at Barb and her family as the model. They're perfect. Sitting in the row behind Barb at church every Sunday is a guy by the name of Joe. Everybody likes Joe, especially the guys. He's a man's man. Joe played football in college for a Pac-10 school. He's filled with stories of athletic conquest. But when Joe's all alone, his heart is filled with emptiness because of his inability to sustain long-term relationships. He's had two marriages that have only lasted six months. And over the years, he's driven away everyone who got close to him with a very short fuse. But that Sunday, when a friend asked Joe how things are going, he quickly says, never better. Never better. You see, Joe and Barb have both learned that church is a place for plastic people. A place for perfect people. So Barb's become Barbies, complete with their husband Ken's and her perfect plastic children. And Joe becomes G.I. Joe, a plastic action hero everyone admires, but nobody really knows. But inside, Barb's sitting on a pew, dying. Joe's sitting on a pew, shriveling up. Churches throughout our culture today and it can even happen at New Hope, can be filled with Barbies and Joes. Somehow we've come to believe that image is everything, and that what counts is how we look, the impression that we make. So often we in the Christian community, we have perfected the fine art of faking it. So what's this antidote to denial? What makes us finally face up to our problems? What makes me face up to my problems? I wished I had an answer that went down better than this. See, God's antidote for denial is pain. We rarely change just because we saw the light. We change when we feel the pain. It was an 8 o'clock service. The thought dawned to me as I said that statement. I hadn't written it down. It's not on my notes. Maybe this is the process and the thought that Jesus intended when he said to you and me, we are to be the light and the salt of the earth. 
But for many, light is not enough. Just exposure to the problem isn't enough. What happens when you pour salt in a wound? It hurts. So maybe part of the role of you and I being salt in this world is people won't stop denying their problems until they experience some of the pain, the heat. We don't change until our fear of change is exceeded by the pain we have. Most people never really move into recovery until they're forced to move to it because they have no other options. God uses at least three denial busters to get our attention to force us to move towards recovery from the things that have messed up our life. Number one, crisis. Things like illness, stress, loss of job, bankruptcy, marriage, and arrest. Now I will tell you, often there are signs that lead up to that crisis. But until the crisis hits, we often won't make a move to recovery. Number two, confrontation. Somebody cares enough to sit down with us and say, you're blowing it. Somebody loves us enough to sit down and say, you're missing out. You're about to lose your family, your health, and everything else. There's an old saying in Texas that goes like this. If somebody calls you a horse's rear, I cleaned that up just a little bit for church today. <laughs> if somebody calls you a horse's rear, ignore it. If two people call you a horse's rear, Pause in front of the mirror. If three people call you a horse's rear, buy a saddle. <laughs> if three people call you a workaholic, buy a saddle. If three people call you an alcoholic, buy a saddle. If three people say you need to get some help, go to celebrate recovery. Pain is like a fire alarm. It goes off warning us that something is wrong in our world. If you had a fire alarm go off in your house, what do you do? Well, that stupid alarm, you pull it down and you throw it in a drawer. Anybody ever done that by chance? Last service, I had one lady, oh yeah, I do that all the time. <laughs> she needs CR. But guys, you might not do that with your fire alarm, but you do that with your pain. You throw it in a drawer of food and you keep eating. You throw it in a cabinet with alcohol and you keep drinking. You throw it in the closet with sexual activity and you keep trying to numb yourself. We find all kinds of different things to cover up the sound of our pain. But it doesn't deal with it. God will use these things to get our attention. There's a family I know of that a few years ago sat down with their brother and their son whole family got around him and said, this has gone on long enough. You have 15 minutes to make a decision. Your drugs or your family. If you choose the drugs, don't come see us until you're ready to stop your drugs and see your family. That's hard. That's tough love. But that's confrontation. Another way God uses to Bust up our denials is through catastrophe. Not just crisis, now catastrophe. I hope he doesn't have to get to that in your life. When the bottom falls out physically, emotionally, spiritually, financially, relationally, when the bottom falls out and you hit bottom, what happens is often God just steps back and he lets us feel the impact of our whole foolish decisions. You want to be God? You think you got it all under control? Okay. And he'll step back and he'll let us play God. And then we will reap what we've sown. And we will feel the impact of the catastrophe in our life. Brendan Manning tells a story in his book called The Ragmuffin Gospel. He said, 25 years ago, I had a drinking problem. I voluntarily entered a 28-day treatment program. Early in the treatment program, they had to sit in a circle with a leader and tell other people in the group about the extent of their drinking. So they went around the circle and they all told their story except for one business guy named Max. When it came time for him to talk about his drinking, he said, I, I, I never really drank that much. Everybody in the room said, Max, you're an alcoholic treatment center for a month. You weren't sipping Pepsi. Tell us the truth. Admit it. He, he said, I, I'm really, I'm being honest with you. I've never really had all that much to drink. Well, coming to the program, they all signed affidavits to be able to get information any way they could about each other. So they had a speakerphone in the center of their circle, and the leader of the group said, I'm going to call the bar that's closest to your office and see what they say. 
So they got on the phone, found the bar, called the bartender, and they said, hey, do you know Max so-and-so? Bartender said, yeah, like a brother. Stopped in here every day after work. Has three to four martinis before he goes home. This guy drinks like a fish. He's our best customer. The rest of the people in the group all looked at Max. Max says, well, yeah, I guess I drink a lot. A little later in the group, they ask everybody, have you ever hurt anybody, a family member, a friend, while you were drunk? Several people in the group described their experience. They got around the circle to Max, who said, uh, I've, I've, I've never hurt anybody, sober or drunk. I, I got four lovely kids. I got a wonderful wife. I'd never hurt them, never. And he says, you know, Max, I, I don't believe you. I'm going to call your wife. So he dials the phone number and says, his, are you Max's wife? Yes, well, we're in the group with him, and we got a question has Max ever mistreated you or close friend or anybody in the family when he's drunk? She said, well, not very often, but, but yes, he has. And most recently, it was Christmas Eve. He took our nine-year-old daughter shopping, and he bought her a new pair of shoes. He's very generous. On the way home, our little girl was sitting in the front seat enjoying her new shoes, and Max passed the bar, saw some friends' cars out front, and so he pulls in, and it was cold. It was 12 degrees out with a high wind chill factor. Oh, well, Max made sure all the windows were rolled up snugly, and he left the car running so the heater was blowing, and he told her nine-year-old daughter, I'll, I'll be right back, just a few minutes, you, you play with your shoes. He went in the bar and started drinking. He didn't come out until after midnight. In that time, the vehicle shut off, and the windows had become frosted over and locked up so tight they couldn't get into the car. When the authorities opened the car and rushed our daughter to the hospital, she already had frostbite so badly she lost her thumb and her forefinger. The wife describes this to the group and Max falls off his chair convulsing to the ground. He just couldn't bear admitting what he had done. He couldn't face it. He was going to live the rest of his life in some fantasy world of denial about what he had done. You may not have a story quite as dra drastic as that but you very well may have a story very similar to that. You're going to live in a plastic world, a fantasy world of denial. We said last week that the first step to recovery is to first realize, R-E-C-O-V-E-R-Y, the acrostic. The first R is realize I'm not God. Admit I'm powerless to control my tendency to do the wrong thing and my life is unmanageable. That is the first step. I'm not God. The second step is what I call the hope step to recovery. Step one says, I admit I'm helpless, I'm powerless. Step two says, there is a power, and that's the good news. There is a power we can plug into that can handle what I can't handle on my own. The E in recovery, earnestly believe that God exists, that I matter to him, and he has the power to help me recover. This comes from a scripture found in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 6. If you underline in your Bible, open your Bible, underline this verse. This is a, not a long verse. Be a good one for you to memorize. This is in the hall of fame of faith in the New Testament. And at the beginning of that chapter, in verse 6, it says, Anyone who comes to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. There are three parts to step two on the road to recovery. Number one, acknowledge God's existence. Let me highlight all three of them real quick for you. Acknowledge God's existence. Understand God's character. And number three, accept God's offer to help us. Okay, so let's jump in on that first one. Acknowledge God's existence. Most of us have no problem with point one. There aren't that many atheists in America. Actually, there's far less than I thought. There really are far less. In, in a recent Pew Research, Pew Research Center is a, like a Gallup poll. And uh, they target particularly faith-based uh, issues. And so in the Pew Research Center did a survey last year, just 2019, that said 4% of the people in the United States say, I'm an atheist. 4%. Okay? So 4 out of every 100. Now, that is up from a decade ago. It was 2%. Now it's 4%. An additional survey says 5% say that they're agnostic. That is up from 3%. 
But here's what I've been discovering in a lot of places is the more people get to know about our universe and now we have computers that are able to compute the odds of things happening, there's less people, it seems like, saying, at least less people in the science field saying, I believe this happened by a random accident. In fact, today it takes more faith not to believe in a creator than it does to believe in one. It takes more faith to believe the odds are greater that there is no creator, no designer, than it all just happened. I mean, I could take this watch, take it completely apart, do every small component that it has, put all these parts into a brown paper bag, shake them up, throw them out on a counter, and what are the odds that it would all end up perfectly put back together so I could put it on my watch and tell in perfect time? Now, there's a whole lot more moving parts to this universe, to this world, than there is in my watch. Most folks would say there must be a designer behind all this. Where there is an effect, there must be a cause. Where there's design, must be a designer. Remember last week? We want to be in control. How do we play God? By denying our humanity and trying to control everything for our own selfish reasons. Like choosing songs for a worship set on Sunday morning. <laughs> hey, Milo. Just a joke. But we say, I want to be the center of my universe. Control is the real issue. See, this step requires the Holy Spirit of God in residence within the human spirit of man to bring about the recovery that we need. But he not only needs to be in residence in our lives, and let me just pause right there so that there's no confusion. What it means for Christ to be in residence in you is that you've invited him to come live in your life. That's what it means to be a Christian. Not being a Baptist, a Presbyterian, a Methodist, a Catholic, anything else. No labels, no signs, no, no, no signature on a statement of faith. No list of do's and don'ts that I try to measure up to in order for God to love me. No. It is a moment in time which by the knocking of God's Spirit upon our heart says, Hey, I love you. I want a relationship with you. The, what you've got to do to have a relationship with me is admit you're not God. Stop trying to be and that's what makes you a sinner. Ask for my forgiveness, which has already been extended through the death of my son on the cross. And at that moment, I will come in and be in residence in your life. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else to being a Christian. But just because he's in residence in your life doesn't mean that you and I are granting him permission to reign in our life. It doesn't mean we've given him authority to be the one who directs every decision that we make in life. Sometimes we hold on to our financial decisions. We'll make those ourselves. Thank you. Sometimes we hold on to relationship decisions. I want to form and shape my relationships the way I want to. I don't care what anybody else says or even the Bible. I'm going to hold this in reserve. But to enjoy all the benefits, and one of the benefits of him being in residence is when we let him reign, then we will not have the habits, hurts, and hang-ups when he is reigning in our lives. It's the reason you need celebrate recovery in the church is too many people have let the Spirit of God be in residence in their life but not reign in them. See, the role of the Holy Spirit within the human spirit of man is to control our emotions, teach our minds, and so direct our will that he changes our behavior. This is not by self-will. This is by God's will. And this way, and by the way, is your will sometimes weak? Some of you are not nodding your head. So if you're on a diet and somebody brings you a homemade chocolate cake and sets it on the counter right in front of you, how good's your will? Mine's perfect. I hate chocolate. <laughs> Bring Grandma Roland's peach cobbler over, I have another problem. His will versus my will. In this way... According to his intended design and his purpose, he governs our behavior so that he in us now is the origin of his own image. He is the source of his own activity. He's the dynamic of his own demands and he's the cause of his own effect. And that's what it means to be a Christian. There was a cover of Time Magazine several years ago. Time Magazine said, science discovers God. In this age where we know more and more about the universe, where we have greater ability through computers to compute random chance, very few people are willing to believe it's just an accident. The more we know about the universe, the more we are convinced there's a creator and we acknowledge his existence. It, it's just a coincidence that last night, Shelly and I watched a Netflix program. We watched the crown. We're watching the crown now. 
when we have time, we sit down, we watch The Crown. It's a series uh, about uh, uh, Queen Elizabeth, all right, sitting on the throne. It's from the beginning. We're, we're right now in, uh, at the time, man landed on the moon. So what, mid-late 60s? 69. And, and Prince Philip, who's an odd duck, um, sorry to our British families in the church, um, but he was good last night. Um, he was at a place in his life where he pretty much rejected his faith. His mother had actually identified his mother who had died just briefly before had pointed her finger at him and said, you're missing something in your life. And he said, uh, she said, you've lost your faith. So he, he viewed these three astronauts who landed on the moon as his heroes. And when they came to the castle, he, he, he manipulated things so that he could have a personal one-on-three meeting with them, just, just him and them. And he, he just knew from these great heroes he was going to get the answers to his struggle in life. And they gave him nothing. And he went back, oh, this takes too long. I can't spend too long. Um, they'd hired a new, a new pastor at the parish there uh, on the palace grounds. And uh, this guy had started a, a ministry to burned out pastors. And he had brought Prince Philip in. To, he was actually using biblical truth and psychology to pull Philip back towards faith. And he brought him in. To, and, and Philip just went off on these guys and told them what losers they were. And then after he had his meeting with these astronauts and found out that they're just mortal men, didn't fill the void that was going on in his life, he became a broken man and he goes back to that group and he apologizes for that and he tells them, I've lost my faith. Will you help me? <sighs> they had celebrate recovery right there in England because he came through a catastrophe, a crisis. He came to the end of himself. But the world will cry out, there is a God. Romans 1.20, since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and his divine nature have been clearly seen. Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God. In fact, the Bible says it's foolish not to believe in him. And if you are here today and you don't believe in an eternal God, but you would like, to, you would like it to come more than just from your own thinking, Call me someday. I've got some wonderful books from an intellectual perspective. I'd be happy to give them to you or tell you where to find them and go read them and then we can dialogue about what you read. Here's the point. God changes life today because he exists. Most of us in the room could say we are who we are today, not because of ourselves, because of the transforming work of Jesus Christ. The real issue for most of us is not, is there a God? That's a given. But what kind of God is he? We develop some very strange ideas about what God is like. Kind of like those two delinquent boys in the Catholic school that had been misbehaving and they were called into the principal's office. The principal knew what these boys needed really was God in their lives, not more discipline. So she brought the first boy in and set him down and she said, I want to ask you a question. Where is God? The kid was scared to death by the question. He didn't know what to answer. She asked it three or four more times. He never answered. She said, okay, I'm going to send you back out and I want you to think about that question. I'll have you come back in for a moment. He goes out and sits down next to the boy and before the principal can call the second boy in, the second boy asks the first boy what they want to know. What are they going to do? And the first boy said, I don't know, but evidently God is missing and they're trying to pin it on us. <laughs> we have strange ideas. Many of us get our ideas from thinking that God is like one of our parents. And here's the tragedy in that. Though I had incredibly good parents, they were not perfect, but I had incredibly good parents. There's a lot of folks, and it may be some of you, had horrible parents. One or both. They were somebody that you feared rather than loved. And we tend to think, I need to be afraid of God. There are some of you who think you're parent is an absentee parent because they were never around and so you think God is an absentee God. There are some of you whose parents were like Santa Claus, gave you everything you wanted and so you think God is like Santa Claus. And so what we do is instead of God making us into his image, we try to shape and fashion and make God in our image. Every once in a while we'll hear somebody say, well my idea about God is you know what? 
Nobody gives a rip what your or my idea about God is. We need to discover God for who he really is. That brings us to point number two, understand God's character. The second step in recovery is not just to acknowledge his existence, but understand his character. Until I know what God is really like, I won't trust him. So how do we get to know him? Paul tells us in Colossians chapter 1, Christ is the visible expression of an invisible God. If you want to know what God is like, investigate Jesus. Because he's the visible expression of the invisible God. Specifically three things. Number one, you can know this is true about God. He knows all about my situation and yours. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Whether it's been a good day, a bad day, an ugly day, week, month, or life. Psalm 56, the Bible says, David wrote, You know how troubled I am, O Lord. You've kept a record of my tears. One translation says, God puts my tears in a bottle. Isn't that incredible? The Bible says God knows us up close and personal and he's bottled up our tears. And yet people keep saying, nobody knows the hell I'm going through in this marriage. You're wrong. God does. Nobody knows how I'm struggling to break this habit. You're wrong. God does. Nobody knows the depression and fear I'm going through. Oh, oh yes. God does. And he's kept a record of your tears. Nothing escapes his notice. David wrote in Psalm 31, you've seen the crisis of my soul, O God. God's aware of our needs, and the Bible says he knows before we even ask. Psalm 69, David says, you know how foolish I've been. Sometimes we want to forget this part. The fact is, there is nothing off the record with God. We have an audience 24-7. God never takes a day off. He knows everything. And you know what? In spite of all that, he loves us with unconditional love. So number one, God knows all about my situation and God cares about my situation. Psalm 103, he is like a loving father to us, tender and sympathetic for he knows that we are made of dust. He knows we're frail and he loves us unconditionally. The Bible says that God is love and he loves us with an everlasting love. He knows about your situation, and he cares about it. Romans 5, 8 says, God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were yet enemies. Many of you have been working the 12 steps, whether in AA or CA, and maybe now in CR, and you know that step two is that higher power step. May I introduce to you the true higher power. His name is Jesus Christ. And number three, God can change me, God can change you, and he can change our situations that's the good news. We must invite him, though, to be in residence and then give him the authority to reign in our lives. Do any of you ever find yourselves paralyzed by procrastination? CR is good for that. I know I need to do this, but I don't get started. Do you ever feel like I just can't get on top of things? God says, I've got the power. If I can raise Jesus from the dead, then I can raise your dead relationship. He can set you free from addiction. He can close the door to your past so those memories stop haunting you. Luke 18 tells us that what is impossible for us is very possible with God. Last of all, accept God's offer to help us. It's not enough just to believe in God. Most of you do, but that hasn't wiped away the hurt. We need to plug into the power source it's more than just believing. Here's what God has to offer. Philippians 2. For God is at work within you, giving you the will and the power to achieve his purpose. God says willpower on your own is not enough. Good intentions are not enough. What you need is his will, his power, producing the change. So you say, I don't even know if I want to change. I'm scared to death of change. Then here's what we pray. God, I'm willing to be made willing. You get this? God, I'm not willing right now, but I'm willing to be made willing for you to do this change in me. What happens when I open my life to God's power? When I ask him to put the spirit of Christ in my life, what does it do? Does it turn me into some kind of religious nut? Oh, I hope not. The Bible tells us exactly what happens. 2 Timothy 1.7, another verse. You should surround, all right, circle, underline. The spirit that God gives us fills us with power, love, and a life under control. Isn't that the way we want our life to be lived? Experiencing the love and the power and the control of God in us.
I want power in my life to break habits I can't break. I want love, real love in my life, to love people like they should be loved and to be loved like I need to be loved. That's the kind of power and love that God gives. And along with that, he gives us a controlled self. I want that. I want that. There's a principle found in the universe. I discovered it in the kitchen. It's a very simple principle, but it's very profound. I've discovered that things work best when they're plugged in. Toasters, blenders, radios, microwaves, when you plug them in. And God meant for you and I to be plugged in to him. First, we believe, and then we receive. Remember the promise of the prophet in Isaiah 43, when you go through deep waters and great troubles, I will be with you. You won't drown. When you walk through the fires of oppression, you won't be burned up. I will be with you this week, this month, this year, as you face the issues you've been afraid to face in your life. Take these steps. Let me close with this. Her name is Vicki. She writes her testimony. And I want to close with Vicki's story. Vicki is not from our CR. Well, we might have a Vicki in our CR, but it's not this one. I'm addicted. I'm not attempting at this time to recover, though I'm growing more aware of my neediness every day. I tell you of this obsession which began in my childhood. My mother knew the same dependence, though I feel she is not as addicted as I am today. I wish she were. It would give us a stronger bond. In my early teen years, I went through a brief period when I was focused on friends and fun, and I didn't think much about it. But then when I got back into it, th th this addiction, I got into it with a passion. I've gone along my whole life progressing rather than declining in dependence. Even with the steady decline of personal control of my life, a couple of years ago, I made a very dramatic plunge. Today, Today, this dependence is the first thing I think about as I gain consciousness in the morning. Without a fix, I can barely stand to face the world or leave my house. And though my mind is off and on it throughout the day and the late evening, there is this resurgence of, how do I describe it? My need for yet another fix. I often feel no peace unless I give in. Things I used to take great pleasure in, watching TV, playing tennis, are, are now irritating distractions to what I want. And, and even saying this, I can freely admit I'm not planning to turn back. I feel like I've only begun and I daily ache for more. I know I won't be satisfied in this life and often thoughts of leaving this world provide me my greatest comfort. This power that has a hold of me won't stop with me either. As I tell you about my dependence, I will shamelessly try to drag you into it with me. I will try to impress you with truths. It won't make you ill, but healthy. It will not damage your relationships you have with others. It'll make them better. It will not make you say, say crazy things you'll regret. It'll make you say things that sound crazy to others. You won't care. What the others think of as sanity is mediocrity. Obsession is the only life worth living. Please try my obsession. Although it's illegal in some countries, thankfully it's legally here. What's it like? Mild responses can be as simple as having a good night's sleep or a general sense of euphoria. Sometimes, and I pray this for all of you, that you can experience such joy, such peace, such euphoria that, that you don't want to breathe again for fear of an ending. Although I've had this happen rarely, I can only describe it as a liquid warmth, happiness, and joy washing over me. Nuclear strength cocaine can't possibly match the buzz that my drug offers. My drug of choice has some street names. If you inhale it, he's called the breath of life. If you try to drink him, he's the living water. If you try to ingest it, it's called the bread of life. 
other popular street names for this drug are Alpha and Omega, Jesus, the Prince of Peace, the Almighty God. Warning, there's no safe dosage. One encounter with this powerful being can leave you changed forever. Where can you get this? Oh, the better question is how. And the best answer is seek and you will find. Want it bad? Don't stop seeking. Don't ever want anything else more. Aim to not want anything else, period. That's a good place to be. Those who don't want to be obsessed are in denial to their addiction. Revelation 3.17 says, You say, I am rich. I've acquired wealth and I don't need a thing. But you do not realize you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. What hurt, habit, or hang up is keeping you from being dependent upon the one who will take you places you could never imagine and do in you things you could never hope. What is it you need to let go of today? What is it you need to stop denying? For some of you, it's to receive him first and foremost. Invite him to come be resident in your life. For the vast majority of you, it may be you need to finally say, I want hands off the controls. God, I want you to reign in me as Lord in life. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we all need recovery. We just have a tough time admitting it. I trust in the quietness of this moment there are those who are doing some very serious business with you. There may be some folks who walked in here for the very first time this morning and they're wondering why they showed up here today. Maybe it was just to hear there is a God who exists and there is a God who cares and there is a God who can rescue May they invite him in using their own words, no family, no, no, no special formula, no specialized prayer, just an honest confession. God, I believe, now come live in my life. For the vast majority, there are people who've walked with you for years, but maybe there's areas of their life they've held in reserve. They've closed the door to you, and they're a plastic Barbie or Ken, or they're a plastic superhero. They want to be real today. Thank you for giving them the will to be willing to let you change them. Thank you. In Jesus' name.